November 1943, Bergen Harbour occupied Norway. Four volunteers, British and Norwegian, are preparing to do something that should be impossible. Each man will climb inside a steel tube barely wider than his shoulders, seal himself in, and pilot that tube through freezing Norwegian waters into one of the most heavily defended German naval bases in Europe. Their target is not a battleship. It is a floating dock, the facility that keeps German U-boats operational in the North Atlantic. Their weapon is not a torpedo. It is 425 pounds of Torpex explosive they must press directly against the target's hull. No standoff distance. They have to physically touch it to destroy it. The craft they are about to operate looks nothing like a submarine. It looks like an oversized torpedo with a tiny glass dome on top. German naval engineers who would later examine one called it crude, primitive, laughably simple. And yet the Kriegsmarine took it seriously enough to immediately begin copying the design. Because what the British had created at a secret facility in Hertfordshire was every harbour commander's nightmare, a weapon that could turn any stretch of water into a killing ground. This is the story of the Wellman submarine. By 1942, the Special Operations Executive faced a problem that conventional naval power could not solve. German capital ships sat in Norwegian fjords, protected by layers of defences that seemed impenetrable. The battleship Tirpitz alone, anchored in Kofjord, tied down enormous Royal Navy resources simply by existing. Churchill called it the Beast. As long as Tirpitz remained operational, Britain had to keep capital ships in home waters to counter a potential breakout into the Atlantic. Bomber Command tried repeatedly to destroy these targets from the air. They failed. The fjords were too narrow for effective bombing runs, forcing aircraft to approach along predictable paths that German gunners could anticipate. Anti-aircraft batteries lined the cliffs on both sides, creating killing zones that bombers had to fly through. Smoke generators positioned around key anchorages could obscure targets within minutes of an alert, turning precision bombing into guesswork. The mountains themselves created turbulence that threw off bombing calculations, sending bombs into rock faces instead of ship decks. Operation title in October 1942 demonstrated the problem clearly. Chariots, British copies of Italian human torpedoes, were transported by fishing vessel toward Trondheim to attack Tirpitz. The mission was compromised when the towing vessel encountered heavy weather and the chariots broke free. The operators survived, but the attack never happened. The Tirpitz remained untouched. Conventional approaches were not working. The Royal Navy considered surface attacks, but the approaches were mined, patrolled and covered by coastal artillery. Submarine attacks faced the same problems, with the added difficulty that Norwegian fjords were often too shallow for conventional submarines to operate effectively. The Germans had chosen their anchorages well. Every obvious avenue of attack had been blocked. SOE needed something unconventional. Not bombers flying overhead or warships trading salvos, but something that could slip beneath the surface, navigate through harbour defences unseen, and deliver explosives directly against enemy hulls. The organisation turned to Station 9, their technical development facility hidden at the Freith Estate near Welland Garden City. Station 9 was unlike any military research establishment. Behind walls patrolled by Alsatian guard dogs, civilian scientists held cover military ranks and developed weapons that existed nowhere in official procurement channels. Security was absolute. Workers were forbidden from discussing their projects even with family members. The facility operated under the cover of the Inter-Services Research Bureau, a name deliberately chosen to sound boring enough that no one would ask questions. Every clandestine device created at Station 9 carried the same prefix, well, derived from wellin. The well bike was a folding motorcycle that could be dropped by parachute. The well rod was a silenced pistol designed for assassination operations. The well gun was a compact submachine gun. And in mid-1942, Lieutenant Colonel John Robert Vernon Dolphin received orders to create the Wellman, a one-man submarine capable of penetrating defended harbours. Dolphin was a Loughborough-trained engineer, not a naval architect. This shaped his entire design philosophy. The official requirement stated that the craft should be operable by anyone with normal intelligence after the briefest possible period of training. No diving certification required, no submarine experience necessary. The operator would sit inside a dry compartment, breathing normal air, controlling the craft through simple mechanical systems. Courage and basic mechanical aptitude would be enough. The result was unlike anything in Royal Navy service. The Wellman measured 20 feet and 6 inches from nose to tail, with its explosive warhead attached. The hull alone stretched 17 feet and 3 inches of welded steel, constructed in sections that could be transported by road and assembled at forward bases. 
total weight came to approximately 2,000 pounds, light enough for launch from a motor torpedo boat using simple davits. Pressure testing pushed the hull to 300 feet, though operational depth was limited to 100 feet for safety margins. Inside, a single operator sat in what designers optimistically described as comparative comfort. Unlike the chariot human torpedo where crews rode exposed to freezing water in diving suits, the Wellman pilot remained dry throughout the mission. Warm hands, warm feet, far less exposure than any other midget submarine crew, no decompression requirements. A single electric motor provided propulsion, powered by batteries that gave a maximum surface range of 36 nautical miles at three knots. That speed, barely faster than a man swimming, was both the Wellman's limitation and its stealth advantage. Faster craft created more wake, more noise, more chance of detection. The Wellman would creep toward its target like a shadow moving through dark water. The attack mechanism was elegantly brutal. The detachable nose section contained 425 pounds of Torpex explosive, a mixture of RDX, TNT and aluminium powder that delivered roughly 50% more blast effect than pure TNT. Magnetic clamps built into the warhead housing would grip the steel hull plating of the target vessel. A clockwork time fuse, adjustable before the mission, would trigger detonation after the pilot had withdrawn to safety. The attack sequence required precise manoeuvring. The pilot would approach his target submerged, using compass and stopwatch to navigate blind toward the estimated position of the hull. He would then surface briefly to confirm his position, submerge again and creep beneath the target's keel where armour plating offered no protection. Warship designers assumed threats would come from the sides or above. They had not planned for explosives pressed directly against the thin bottom plating designed only to keep out water. Once in position, the pilot would release the warhead section. The nose detached while the magnets held it against the hull. The Wellman, now lighter by 400 pounds, would rise slightly in the water. The pilot would compensate with ballast, withdraw to a safe distance, and the clockwork would count down. A well-executed attack would leave no trace until the explosion. This was what made the concept terrifying to harbour defenders. A conventional submarine attack gave warning. Periscope sightings could be reported, torpedo wakes could be spotted and evaded, explosions could be traced to a bearing and range, allowing depth charge counterattacks. The Wellman offered none of these signatures. A ship could be sitting peacefully at anchor one moment and torn apart from below the next with no warning and no obvious attacker to pursue. Harbour security would have to change completely. Every shadow in the water became a potential threat. Every unexplained ripple might be death approaching at walking pace. Anti-submarine nets would need to extend to the harbour floor. Patrol boats would need to cover every approach. Divers would need to inspect hulls before ships could safely move. The mere existence of a weapon like the Wellman imposed costs on the enemy far beyond its production expense. Production moved with wartime urgency. SOE ordered 150 units from Morris Motors in Oxford, with body panels manufactured by Pressed Steel Company at Cowley. The automotive industry's expertise in precision welding and mass production translated directly to submarine construction. Workers who had built car bodies now built pressure hulls. By autumn 1943, approximately 100 Wellmans had rolled off the production line. Training courses ran at Fort Blockhouse in Gosport, the Royal Navy's submarine school. Volunteers learned the craft systems in classroom sessions before progressing to actual operations. The training sequence was deliberately simplified. Operators practiced depth control in the enclosed compartment, learning to balance buoyancy using small water tanks. They rehearsed the attack sequence against mock targets, approaching submerged, surfacing to confirm position, diving again, and releasing the dummy warhead against the target hull. Navigation training proved the most challenging. Without a periscope, pilots had to develop a feel for underwater movement that bordered on instinct. They would surface, take a compass bearing on the target, note the range, then submerge and count their progress by timing their speed. At three knots, a mile took 20 minutes. A half-mile target approach meant 10 minutes of blind running, trusting the compass and hoping no current pushed them off course. Advanced sea trials moved to Loch Cairnborn in the Scottish Highlands, where the deep, sheltered waters allowed realistic exercises against anchored vessels. Mock attacks against the depot ship HMS Titania proved the concept could work when conditions favoured the attacker. In calm water, good visibility, and familiar surroundings, Wellman pilots could find their targets and deliver their charges. Now, before we see what happened when these craft met the enemy, if you are enjoying this deep dive into British engineering, hit subscribe. It takes a second, costs nothing, 
and helps the channel grow. All right, let us get into Operation Barbara. The target was the Laxavog floating dock complex in Bergen Harbour. This facility provided maintenance and repair services for German U-boats operating in the North Atlantic, the same submarines that were strangling Britain's supply lines. Destroying the floating dock would force U-boats to return to German ports for servicing, reducing their time on patrol and easing pressure on Allied convoys. Four Wellmans would launch from motor torpedo boats of the 30th Flotilla, departing Lunavo in Shetland. The journey to Bergen covered roughly 200 nautical miles across the North Sea. MTBs would carry the Wellmans as deck cargo, launching them within range of the harbour approaches. Four volunteers would then navigate the final miles alone. The crews reflected the Allied nature of the war. W-45 carried Lieutenant C. Johnson of the Royal Norwegian Navy. W-46 held Lieutenant Björn Pedersen of the Norwegian Army. W-47 was piloted by Lieutenant B. Maris of the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve. W-48 belonged to Lieutenant J. Holmes of the Royal Navy. Each man had volunteered knowing the odds. Each went anyway. The operation launched on the night of November 20th, 1943. What happened next revealed the Wellman's fatal flaw, one so fundamental that it seems incomprehensible in retrospect. The craft had no periscope. This was not an oversight or a component delayed by production difficulties. It was a deliberate design choice. Colonel Dolphin had prioritised simplicity throughout the programme and periscopes added mechanical complexity, maintenance requirements and potential failure points. The Wellman would navigate using compass bearings taken while surfaced, then submerge and proceed blind toward the target. Visibility underwater came only from small armoured glass segments in the conning tower dome. Useless for navigation in the darkness of a Norwegian November night, to know where they were going, pilots had to surface, and surfacing meant being seen. On November 21st, the operation was compromised. The Wellmans had been hiding near Yeltholmen Island, waiting for darkness to cover their final approach, but they had been spotted. Whether by local fishermen or harbour patrols, the element of surprise, the only real advantage these slow and lightly armed vessels possessed, was gone. German defences would now be alert. That night, Lieutenant Pedersen in W-46 attempted to press the attack anyway. His craft crept toward the harbour entrance, navigating by dead reckoning through waters he could not see. Then disaster struck. W-46 became entangled in an anti-submarine net stretched across the approach channel. The Wellman carried no net-cutting equipment. This was another simplification, another capability sacrificed for ease of operation. Peterson was trapped underwater in a steel tube, his batteries draining, his air supply finite with no tools to free himself. He had no choice but to blow his ballast tanks and surface. A German patrol vessel spotted the tiny conning tower almost immediately. Peterson was captured along with his intact Wellman. The remaining three operators, recognising that their mission was now compromised beyond recovery, scuttled their craft in deep water and escaped ashore. With help from the Norwegian resistance, they evaded German search parties for months, hiding in safe houses and moving through occupied territory, before finally being extracted by MTB 653 on February 5, 1944. The operational record could not have been worse. Zero enemy vessels damaged, zero explosives delivered to target, four Wellmans lost, one operator captured with his craft intact. The floating dock at Bergen remained fully operational, continuing to service the U-boats that threatened Allied shipping. Yet the story does not end with this failure. German naval engineers examined the captured W-46 with intense professional interest. Their official assessment was dismissive. They called the engineering unsophisticated, the design approach crude by Kriegsmarine standards, but their actions contradicted their words. Within months, Corvetten Kapitän Hans Bartels had completed a prototype of the Biber, a German one-man submarine. The captured Wellman helped validate the concept, and the Biber followed with what the British had fatally omitted, a proper periscope for submerged navigation and a petrol engine for faster surface transit. The Biber program eventually produced over 300 craft and saw extensive combat deployment against Allied shipping after D-Day. The Biber achieved minimal operational success, sinking only one Allied merchant vessel, while carbon monoxide poisoning from the petrol engine killed numerous German pilots. But the program's very existence proved something important. The Kriegsmarine, despite publicly mocking the Wellman's construction quality, had recognised the threat the concept represented. A weapon that could infiltrate harbours and destroy ships at anchor was worth developing, even starting from a flawed original. Comparison with successful midget submarine programmes shows what the Wellman attempted and why it failed. 
The Royal Navy's X-Craft measured 51 feet with a four-man crew. Commander, pilot, engine room artificer, and diver worked together, dividing tasks that overwhelmed a single Wellman operator. Diesel electric propulsion gave 500 nautical mile range and faster sprint speeds. X-Craft carried periscopes for covert approach, wet and dry compartments for diver operations, and equipment for cutting through anti-submarine nets. In September 1943, while Wellman crews were still training for Bergen, X-Craft successfully attacked the battleship Tirpitz in Kufjord. The assault crippled the beast for months and earned two Victoria Crosses. In September 1944, X-24 returned to Bergen and successfully destroyed the floating dock that had defeated the Wellmans. The Italian Mayal human torpedo demonstrated another successful approach. Two-man crews rode externally in diving suits, able to leave the craft and manually defeat obstacles. At Alexandria in December 1941, Mayal teams crippled the battleships HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Valiant, shifting Mediterranean naval power dramatically. The British copied this concept directly as the chariot. These successes shared features the Wellman lacked. Multiple crew members, proper navigation equipment, tools for defeating defences. The Wellman sacrificed all of these for a simplicity that proved insufficient. General Sir Robert Laycock, commander of combined operations, had declared the Wellman unsuitable for operational deployment before Barbara even launched. SOE pressed ahead anyway. Production halted in October 1943 after approximately 100 units. At least one operational Wellman survives today. W-48, Lieutenant Holmes's scuttled craft, was recovered from Bergen waters on September 2, 1949, and now rests at the Royal Norwegian Navy Museum in Horten. Visitors can see for themselves how cramped the compartment was, how limited the visibility through those armoured glass segments, how much courage it took to seal yourself inside and head toward enemy guns. The Imperial War Museum displays not a Wellman, but a German Biber, the descendant of the captured W-46. British innovation, German imitation, neither nation made the concept truly work in combat. The men who volunteered for Operation Barbara showed extraordinary courage. They climbed into steel tubes knowing the odds, attempted to penetrate one of Europe's most defended harbours, and when the mission failed, evaded capture for months in occupied territory. Their bravery was not diminished by the inadequacy of the weapon they were given. The Wellman submarine stands as proof that innovation alone does not guarantee success. The concept was sound. A simple, mass-producible harbour attack weapon capable of striking ships at anchor. The execution fell short because simplifications eliminated essential capabilities. German commanders feared what the Wellman represented. They feared it enough to copy it, but fear alone could not make a flawed design succeed in combat. Sometimes the path forward runs through failure. The Royal Navy concentrated resources on the four-man X craft, which achieved what the Wellman could not. Sometimes courage deserves better tools, and sometimes a good idea needs more than bravery to become an effective weapon. The tiny submarine designed to be every German captain's nightmare became instead a lesson in steel. The Wellman failed for multiple reasons. No net cutting equipment. Painfully slow speed. A one-man crew overwhelmed by competing demands. But all of those problems become survivable if you can navigate covertly, if you can approach without surfacing to check your position. In the case of the Wellman, that capability was missing, and its name was a periscope. 